podcast tonight on the podcast, we have the owner of John Gilfoyle. Is it Gilfoyle? It is Gilfoyle, yes. Gilfoyle Public Relations Firm, the president, John Gilfoyle. Thanks for being on the show, John. Robert, thank you for having me. So, John, let's talk about your background and why you founded Gilfoyle Public Relations Firm. Well, uh, it really goes back to necessity being the mother of invention, Robert. I uh, was a news reporter. I was a Metro reporter for the Boston Globe for about six years. Uh, really loved it. Enjoyed the chase of the story, building sources, building relationships, getting to know the city and its people. Uh, and then I uh, had the opportunity to go work for Mayor Thomas M. Menino of Boston at the end of his historic administration, became deputy press secretary. It was a significant pay increase, which is uh, a motivating factor for a lot of us, <laughs> admittedly, that go into public relations from journalism. But uh, you know, then I, I served a little over two years in the administration. And uh, what happened to me was what happens to a, a good chunk of the political appointees in this country. Uh, a new mayor came in and I got laid off, got let go. So um, I'm literally sitting there in January of 2014 collecting unemployment because I had I stayed till the absolute end for my mayor and did not have something else lined up and decided to write a business plan. And I had this idea. I, I had been at the finish line of the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013 uh, and saw how effective Boston police was uh, and really how they've always been very effective at communications and media relations, particularly under Edward Davis, former commissioner at Davis. And I, and I had this idea, you know, I think I can create um, something of a business where I can be on call to do this high level PIO work for rural police departments, volunteer fire departments, and, you know, agencies that don't have the budget, even for 10 hours a week. Um, but if I can get a lot of them together and, and create a coalition um, and regionalize it, maybe I can make a living at it. And uh, 10 years later, we're in 40 states. Really? Uh, yeah, a lot of that's training. We're, we're active for PR and website in, I believe, 12 states. And we do, uh, we've done media relations and comms training in 41 states today. Oh, that's outstanding. That's Thank really you. awesome. You know, and it's a unique thing to, to make that leap to say, okay, can I can I go to a police department that's relatively small, doesn't have the professional staff to handle the public relations side of it, and can I pitch them, hey, in a crisis or whatever, you come to me. How, how did that work with some of those smaller departments? Well, you know, a lot of it was convincing them that I was going to stick around. I think a lot of people weren't sure what to make of me when I first started out. And a lot of them assumed that they could not afford to go down this direction. And then I had two police chiefs come to me. One told me uh, I can pay you $99 a month. And one told me you can pay me $99 a year. And I accepted both of them. I said, you know what, chief, your, your um, evaluation of my performance, you telling your fellow chiefs how I've done is, is worth, that's my marketing uh, budget for the year. If, <laughs> if I do a good job for you. So a lot of that was just convincing people that I was legitimate with a legitimate idea. Um, and then a lot of it also was training. I had a lot of the writing background. I was, I was decent at the media relations, but I had to go and take ICS and I had to go and go through FEMA and go through those classes. I'm still going through that. I mean, I've been teaching college for 14 years and teaching media relations for 10 years, and I'm still going down to South Carolina to take the advanced P. PIO course for five days next month. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a forever student at the end of the day. And I think that's been a lot. Uh, that's been a big part of my success is showing my clients that I'm, I'm never satisfied, really. And I think that's important for any PIO to not just say, I'm going to wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not take any more training. I've got enough. I don't think there's ever enough training for what we do. Never. And, you know, I, I've done, taken, created and listened to training classes on Twitter and now we have to change those classes, frankly, uh, as I'm sure we'll talk about this evening. But yeah, but also there's a lot of bad public relations done in government. Uh, and that's a big, big thorn in my side. You know, a pu public information, is, a public information officer is a public relations professional for a certain sector of emergency services or government. And they need to be trained in public relations, not just police and fire procedures. They need to know how to do PR. And a lot of, a lot of people either have a, a marketing background or a photography background or just a law enforcement background, and they need to accept 
that I need to learn public relations if I'm going to be a successful public information officer. And, you know, you and I have seen some some catastrophic examples of, of that going wrong. Yeah. And we've seen examples of it going right that don't get the attention because that's the, the nature of our business, uh, fortunately. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it, it's interesting that you bring up the fact that they need to have that public relations training because I think a lot of chiefs still to this day still think that they can just throw any sworn person in there or sometimes they throw that person in there that's injured on light duty and just say, put that guy in there and he'll, he'll do just fine. Yeah. Or you take someone, uh, you know, uh, one day a week cause they know how to, cause they're pretty good at Twitter uh, or they, they know how to take a picture. They have a big camera. Um, that's not good enough. It's a, it's a profession and the PIO public relations is a function of management. Uh, I spoke with uh, Elaine Driscoll who worked for Boston police as their director of comms. I'm actually writing a PR textbook right now for undergraduate. And she wrote the intro to my government communications chapter. And I'm still learning about the work that she did in Boston and the work that I've been following in my work um, in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, it's, it's a function of management and the PIOs that have been the most successful, sorry, and the, the PIOs that have been the most successful have not only had the backing of their chiefs and commissioners, but the chiefs and commissioners have made it clear through their commander's intent that this is not a low-level employee of the department. This is someone important who you're going to hear from. And when you have that expectation in your department, people are a little more careful knowing that there could be a press release or, or a news conference, uh, that, that this is not going to be uh, quiet necessarily. Or when let, let's not be so fatalistic when they do the great work, when they do the good human work that police and fire do every single day, that they're going to get the credit and the attention that they might not be asking for, but that they deserve uh, and that we should be throwing more and more of that good stuff out there every day. John, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to ask this question, but you brought it up and, and telling the good stories, storytelling is something that PIOs don't always do. They say, oh, we'll throw it up on Twitter or we'll throw it up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And we're good. We got a picture of our officer doing a great job. But we really have to be good about pitching the stories to the media and pitching them to the right media organization so that you get the maximum amount in the bank for the from the public for the goodwill that you've done. Yeah, there's a couple of examples that come to mind that that don't take a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, you know, one, you know, is you know the the the, the homeowner that has the heart attack while mowing their lawn and the police officers go back to the house and mow, finish mowing the lawn while he's in the hospital recovering. We had a story out of uh, Somerset, Massachusetts a couple of years ago, right around Christmas, uh, a single mother is caught shoplifting from a grocery store. She's not stealing batteries and razors and electronics. She's stealing food. And rather than prosecute her, the officer used my favorite tool in the police arsenal, the, his discretion, decided not to arrest her, um, get, you know, return the items that were taken, but then went to a different store, filled a cart with groceries. She was there shoplifting with her children, filled the cart with groceries, paid for it with his own money and delivered that Christmas meal to that family. Um, not to, not condoning what was happening, but to show that I, I see you, I hear you, fellow human in my community. I know it's not perfect, but uh, you know, I'm going to give you, you and your children something to eat. That ended up going national. Um, you know, These are the stories you have to find. The baby being born at home unexpectedly and a police officer, because a police officer is almost always going to get there first, the police officer having to, to catch the baby. Uh, I love those stories because now you're part of somebody's best day or first day of their life, not their worst or their last day. So we need to dig those stories up and we need a, a chief, a commander, a, a commissioner that's going to set a philosophy that or a culture that this is the norm. We're going to when you do these things that matter, whether they're routine, quote unquote, routine or not, we're going to be telling those stories from our department. And that's why you need a real PR person. Right. And, and on the other end of that is one of the things that we have to do is get the staff to buy into what you're doing because a lot of them are afraid to go in front of the media. They don't want to talk to them. But if you tell your stories internally as well, the good things that they're doing, they're going to be more apt to come forward when they, when somebody sees someone else doing something and share that information. In my own department, we've had staff come forward because we've been really good about sharing things. And as a result, we've had some really great stories come out that 
I pitched to newspapers, I pitched to TV stations, I pitched to a national station, uh, national network, and gotten a lot of good coverage out of it. Yeah, and you have to pitch. That's a it's a typical PR tool. It's not just uh, you know having a press conference during a major event. That's easy. And I continuously train my staff on this. You know, we we're spoiled in our in our world where, uh, in psychology terms, we have a high degree of control mutuality over our audience. As a public information officer, the press always takes our call. They're always going to listen. They're always going to respond. Um, and that and we have their attention, which is very valuable. What we have to do is take that attention and convert it into the good, the unheard stories, not just the breaking news. FEMA teaches the 95-5 rule, which I think is a really important thing, especially for police in 2023 and beyond. You know, 19 out of 20 of your press releases should not be about an arrest, should not have a mugshot, should not have charges. They should not be related to incidents. They should be related to the regular day-to-day -day work that you do in your department. And there's a lot of stories in those 19 if you can find I agree. I agree. All right, John, so let's change gears here. Mm -hmm. Twitter. Twitter recently had been pushing towards a page tier system, and everybody is, is seeing that with uh, the, the, the takeover by Elon Musk. The Twitter blue check mark disappeared unless you're paying for it now. And one of the questions I have is, right now, government agencies are getting the gray check mark, and it's free. Do you see that remaining that way for the future, or do you see some change coming in there for government agencies. I definitely see that gray check mark remaining there. That that's a, a crisis management step that Twitter took in, in the face of a lot of backlash over its its recent actions. The more worrying change that Twitter's made has been to block access to its API, which you know those of us that have to do the tech you know, we've been relying on the auto posting features for a long time. Right. You know, I work with hundreds of rural and small town police and fire departments, and we have WordPress based websites that we set up for them or news blogs that we set up for them. And the, the rub on those websites is WordPress can be configured to automatically email content to your subscribers for free and automatically post content to your Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter accounts automatically. So if you're in a rural fire department or a small police department and you have a, a tree fall down on Main Street in the middle of the night or lightning strike something, you can post one paragraph or have a dispatcher post one paragraph on your website and poof, it's everywhere. And you've done the whole PIO rigmarole in five minutes, not 45 minutes. Right. Twitter has stripped access to automatically post content to its service, meaning that your police department's website can no longer automatically post content to Twitter. That's a disaster. To me, that's, I, I don't want to use the D word lightly, but that's the closest we can come to saying that Twitter could be dying because if newsmakers don't view Twitter as a legitimate place to post its news, its information, then the, the, the media will stop paying attention. The public will stop paying attention. Influencers will stop being so influential and Twitter will fade the way a lot of other large social networks. We have to remember this. You know, we, We've had 20 years of dominance by Twitter and Facebook, really 15, 18 years of dominance, but everything that came before them died out. Uh, and you know, we we forgot that that's typically what happens to a to a website or a social network uh, it has a little bit of a, a rise and a, and a very quick fall. I I I I shudder to think that we're seeing the fall of Twitter because it's been such a valuable news making tool. But that to me is the most devastating thing they've done uh, of all the controversial changes is stripping away the ability to to use its service unless you're using the one that they're controlling or right. paying for. Right. They want the one that they're going to pay for. Now, do you think, is it possible that Elon in his, in his thought process was saying, let's strip the API out temporarily. Let's, let's get, let's impact all those business sites like the Hootsuite and all those other ones that were able to connect without paying a fee mm -hmm. and they're charging exorbitant fees for their service. Could it, could he be working on saying, okay, you're going to, if you have a blue check mark or you have a gray check mark, you'll be able to post to the API without a problem. Yeah, is the, that it, something down the line that may, is a possibility? I, I do think that if, if cooler heads prevail and if Twitter is smart, it will give, it will give out the gray check marks uh, more efficiently. The problem is a lot of, my clients don't have a great check mark yet. Uh, a lot of these rural departments and these small towns don't have 
these in the instant recognition that the city of New York has from, you know, from Twitter. So they've got a lot of catching up to do there. So ultimately, yes, I do think there will be like Google, a government and nonprofit tier to Twitter, unless they've completely lost their minds. Um, but the, the problem is it's like the paywalls all over again, Robert, you know, yeah. it, you know, the, you know, boston.com was registered as a domain in 1995 and it provided the Boston Globe's news coverage for free for nine years, uh, 10 years until they finally decided uh, that we're, we're going to put up a bostonglobe.com and charge for it. And they've done very well. Uh, it's over several years in the interim trying to, to get people to subscribe to it. But in a way, the journalism has been too late to that. They should have started charging for this at the beginning. Uh, if, if, you know, Hootsuite never should have been allowed to exist as a service that profited off of Twitter's API over the last, what, 12 years? Well, now we're a decade into it. It's part of our daily lives and our routine, and you're punishing the user because you the, the, you know, and to Musk's credit, the previous managers of Twitter, owners of Twitter, did not have the foresight to properly monetize their platform. In a way, that's that's economics for you. That's uh, capitalism for you at the end of the day. Absolutely. So what alternatives would you see uh, police and fire and EMS if they don't have budgets to fit a fee structure where they're going to pay for an API? If you have to pay for Twitter's API, I don't think that police and fire should make that investment. And the weird thing is we've seen a tremendous resurgence in Facebook over the past year where we thought Facebook was the one that had, you know, the, 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 the uh, cuts in the armor that we thought Facebook was the one that was dying the slow death. What we've seen is people have gone back. They've gone back to what they're familiar with, which, which is, you know, less controversial. Um, also, I've been saying this for months now. If Instagram would just let people put a URL in their posts, they, they, this would solve all that. People would just go right to Instagram. Um, right. Instagram has been sort of mired in its 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 network. The problem with Instagram is its its market, its users have aged with Instagram, and it has not kept the same age group. They just had that age group age into it the way Snapchat did, the way other social networks that didn't grow as fast or didn't grow enough did. If Instagram, which of course is owned by Meta, which owns Facebook. I've always thought that if Instagram would just put allow you to put a URL in your posts with your picture and link to a, a press release or a blog post or a product, that they would capture a, a significant amount of market share from the news making audience that use, use Twitter religiously overnight. Right, and and the problem is with like a municipality or or a police department, they don't have the the digital experts that can create the 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 online buttons to click on and link over. You just don't have that. So they, Correct. They, we don't have coders. Out. Yeah, we don't have programmers. We don't. Have, they, they, nobody knows how to make the connections between Twitter and a, and a, uh, they don't know how to make their own software that can connect to Twitter. We've relied on these these free or these low cost third parties for a long, long time. But Facebook and Instagram are familiar, so we know how to work in those tools. And I think that's why ultimately, um, I don't think it's Mastodon. I don't think it's one of these. Uh, startup, you know, Twitter killers that have been coming around. I think there's a niche that will go to a Mastodon or other similar groups, but they tend to be of the same mindset. Um, and ultimately what that's done, frankly, is just made Twitter more of a conservative voice. And it's pushed a lot of left-leaning voices onto other platforms. And that's actually bad for Twitter to have, you know, to, you know, Musk made the argument that Twitter was too focused on amplifying liberal voices. Well, now we've pushed liberal voices sort of away and amplified conservative voices. That's good for about five minutes for our for our demographic. And then people call it propaganda. And now where are we after that? Right. Exactly. I agree. All right. So let's talk about this, John. Can you talk about owning your media and why it's so important? Yes, uh, and, you know we we pitch website first at JGPR. We've always done that, and you know we still get PIOs for other departments that come to us and like, well, why, you know, why do I need it? Why do we even need a website? You know, I don't, you know, I, I'm great on Facebook. I have great, uh, you know, virality. I have great um, connections to my audience. I can interact. I can talk to them. They talk to me. Um, you know, they've got a fan base, a following. Why do I need to do a website? Well, the answer is simple. Twitter and Facebook could be gone tomorrow. Facebook had a, a nearly full day outage a year or so ago, and a lot of agencies didn't have a way to communicate with their public. And I, I want to stop and really amplify that for a second, Robert. There were police and fire departments in this country that didn't know what to do when Facebook went down. Yep. 
that's disastrous. You know, if you have to reach people, if, there's a, if you're a public school and the school bus is going to be canceled, if you're a police department and you're trying to shelter in place and you don't know how to log into your services, that could be, frankly, a life or death situation for some people. So you can't be dependent or, or totally dependent on a single platform because you don't own that platform. Elon Musk owns Twitter, Meta owns Facebook and Instagram, uh, and some other rich person owns whatever other service that you want to use. But if you have a good website and you have a good newsletter and you have a good email marketing platform, if you have a good reverse 911 or code red system, if you if you have all those things and you're routinely using them for the right purposes and you have triggers on, on, on when you're going to use them and you're doing it consistently, now you're owning your message and not just relying on uh, the algorithm to spread your message out there. The other problem with social media, Robert, is that it's, it's, it's the feed. I can scroll past you on Twitter or Facebook and never see it again. But if I'm trained as a, a resident to be on the website, I'm going to see that news and everything else that you want to tell me over the last week or so. Right. And I always, I'm looking towards like, our, I, I want to jump back to the incident that happened in Idaho with the murders of the four college students. And the, the police department there originally or eventually created a separate website so that they could gather information and, and keep the public informed. I, I think that's something that a lot of agencies forget to create a black page, you know, that's pre-formatted so that you can turn it live at a, at a drop of a hat um, and, and put it out there for where the media and the public in general. Yeah, you, you can deploy a WordPress site in an hour if you know what you're doing. And even if you don't know what you're doing, maybe you can do it in two hours. It, it's great software, and it's very intuitive, and it's very easy to use. Uh, you know, we have deployed police. You know, a lot of our police departments are locked into a municipal contract with a large vendor, which we don't like. We I don't like police departments being stuck on the town website. I think every police and fire department and library and school should have their own separate .com or .org that's not controlled by the town. But a lot of my clients have their official website as, you know, town of whatever dot gov slash police. Yep. Well, that's a separate, a separate podcast. We could talk about that for an hour, another day. But what we do in that situation is we'll deploy, okay, my town PD news.com and we'll set up a very simple WordPress blog without the history pages and the chief's page and the history of our badge and patch page. We'll leave that on the town site. Fine. We'll put the news on somewhere separate. And when we can do that, we've had departments in crisis. We have one right now in New Mexico that's in crisis. We can launch a WordPress blog for them. And when we have a data dump or we have a multimedia file dump, we want to get information out quickly and transparently. We can put it in one place and we're not relying on people seeing it on Facebook to reach the the folks that matter, which are our, our, our residents, our reporters, our business community, our visitors of our city or town. And nothing ha that I've seen replaces a good, well-maintained website. So John, is this what you're talking about, the single source writing in situations where that are more complicated, like in an officer involved shooting? Very similar to that. And that goes to what we've been talking about for the, the, the full half hour so far, which is, you know, you need to have good tools that you can control and deploy at a moment's notice. And your PIO has to be a member of management. You know, I go back to May 25th, 2020, and, you know, the, the press release said, you know, two officers arrived and located a suspect, you know, dot, dot, dot. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect in handcuffs. Notice he was suffering medical distress. Officers called an ambulance, transferred to medical center where he died a short time later. That was George Floyd. And that was the press release that Minneapolis police wrote about the George Floyd murder. Yeah. It's unacceptable. I mean, we all, you know, we, 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 we shudder and we, we, we react to these things because that's our job being called into question. You and I both. You know, our livelihood gets called into question when we watch a PIO be handed a piece of paper by a, by a low middle manager and said, here, press lackey, put this out. Yeah. It's dangerous. And, that, and you, you, if, if a PIO doesn't have access to the, the, the facts, the chief, the decision makers, the departments, and can't independently craft a message that might be subject to some editing or maybe the lawyers get involved and cut. We've, we've both have had, our, I've had lawyers cut things from our press releases before. Oh, yeah. That's fine. But if you don't even get to that stage, if you're, if you're an order taker, you've already done a disservice to yourself and your department. And, you know, they, going back to that date, 
I need to think about this. The sheer number of people that watch that unfold live and for them to think, oh, we're just going to throw this out there and hope that nobody listens during a pandemic. Yeah. Nine minutes yeah. and 29 seconds. You know, I, I, you know, I work with police, fire, public schools, public health, government, town governments. But, you know, I got my start working for police. And, you know, I, you know I'm not be below being referred to as a copagandist or a liar by people who just assume that when you put the, the phrase public relations in front of police, that it equals a lie. I, you know, what, what I want to do is make sure that my body of work reflects the opposite of that even when i have to disagree with something you know we recently and uh, we're dealing with this now in fact we recently had a a press release go out from uh, the barica mass police department and what essentially happened was during a traffic stop a suspect opened a, a, several bags of powder in the car um and it, was, it got on the suspect it got on the officer who was trying to stop that from happening and it turns out that what was in that that bag uh, was fentanyl and the officer, a half hour later, felt unwell, passed out in front of paramedics, was taken to a hospital, and was treated and released. We know that fentanyl in the air, being you know out in the in the open, is not going to cause an overdose. And we tried to be careful. We even updated the press release a number of times to reflect, you know, that you know we 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 do believe that whether it was stress or anxiety or a, a anxiety response or it was an adrenaline response or it was something else to have, to have to do with this situation that a person going to work and having a bag of white powder opened in their face was what ultimately made them pass out there are people who reacted extremely aggressive to that press That's release right. yeah. and and you know, we took a lot of heat from that and uh, there are uh, independent journalists and there are anti-police activists and there are even medical professionals who, who um, took a stand against that. And we, we, read, we read the feedback and the department made changes to that press release to make it more clear that it wasn't a con we weren't drawing a conclusion that an officer reacted or overdosed to fentanyl because it was out there, but that the, the, the body of facts that happened in that situation ultimately led to the police officer losing consciousness or passing out. But you can't be perfect at the end of the day. And there's gonna be people, yeah. especially in our world, that just don't accept the response it, short of saying all of you are right we are totally wrong and that's it we're going to shut up shop there's nothing else we can do sometimes but we we try and that was very frustrating because a lot of, you know my staff was taking flack for it people were being called out by name the police were being called liars but ultimately even when you're trying to tell the truth you're not going to please everybody oh yeah and john I'll, I'll give you a great example so my department we we, we put out significant event briefings they're, they're uh, a conglomeration of video, uh, body camera video, mm -hmm. surveillance video, maps, uh, narrative, and we talk about what occurred, whether it's an officer involved shooting, um, and and we we put those out, and then people turn around and say, well, you you put out an an edited video and you doctored it, and all of the they say all these things, and yet everything says exactly what we're saying and it shows exactly what we're saying we didn't edit video we just cut the two the video to fit the time frame of what we were covering they yeah. want to see some poor person go through and you know maybe commit suicide or that's not something that needs to be on tv that's not yeah. something we need to show the public yeah and you have to make those decisions judging you know uh, you know taking into account the the public good your, your duty under the law and what's correct from a comms perspective. But ultimately, you know, we're in a spot where we have to sometimes call truth to power. And there's a lot of people that just don't believe that public relations people exist to do good. Um, but people have been fired because of the work of good public information officers. People have been indicted because of the work of good public information officers. At the end of the day, a police officer or a firefighter doing something bad is something that we have to call out every time we see it. You know, Ed Davis, a former Boston police commissioner, he ruffled feathers in Boston because he would be very aggressive and he would be very forthcoming and he'd be, he would speak candidly about police misconduct cases. Now, there are people in the department that didn't like that, but it ultimately helped build credibility among a, a public that was wary of its police department. And the, the public in the U.S. is wary of its police departments right now. The Boston Globe had three police misconduct stories on the front or, or metro front of the paper today. 
That's unacceptable. And they're serious things. And we had, we dealt with two of them, unfortunately, in our line of work, in our business. Um, ultimately, the, the PIO's job is to protect the integrity of the profession, of the entity. In that situation, a civilian is a very useful person to have um, as your PIO because they're not at the same level life-wise as a sworn officer. Uh, and I've seen good civilians do great work in that regard. I mentioned Elaine Driscoll, you know, she, you know, she's one of them. Uh, and I've tried to do that in my career. And, you know, I, I, I struggle existentially with the fact that, you know, I'm a PIO at the Boston Marathon bombing. I get laid off. All my friends at the Globe get Pulitzers. Or I, you know, I try to, I tell the truth about a police shooting. I get called a copaganist and a liar and a baby killer. And I'm trying to balance um, the, the, the horrible thing that's happened and try to get the truth out. And I'm getting 911 calls together and body camera footage and scanner audio and unredacted or minimally redacted police reports. And I'm trying to make sure everyone knows what happened so that they can, you know, formulate a decision on this but social media is can be a difficult place sometimes and ultimately the public what we have to understand as pios the public is weary of us and of our bosses right now and all that means is we got to work harder we got to earn it john so what do you see what mistakes do you see the police or fire uh pios frequently make the number one mistake a PIO can make is accepting information without checking it. That's the number one. You know, we covered that today. Um, other than that, there's a lot of little things that get that get missed. Um, number one, if you're writing a press release and you're not using AP style and not writing in the inverted pyramid, um, stop. You know, get the AP style book, buy a news writing book. We want to speak the language of our noble adversary. We want to speak the language of the journalist, uh, and they want to be able to easily digest the information that you're putting out. Also, if you're writing a press release that that um, is aggressively um, advocating a side, you're going to be looked at more suspiciously than just putting out facts um, uh, uh, you know, dispassionately. A, a good PR writer should be advocating on behalf of their client's point of view, but should be dispassionate in the delivery of information. Excellent. All right. So on the other side of it, what do you see that they do positively? I think that we're getting stories out. I, I'm seeing them around the country. Uh, I think that we're seeing uh, a pivot to be more uh, adapting to television reporters. Uh, the TV, you know, as the newspapers have closed and shuttered and died, and how a couple of big companies have decimated local news uh, newspapers across our country, the TV news reporters are still there, uh, both locally and nationally. But locally, for our purposes. We've seen a much greater willingness among first responders to go on camera and talk to a reporter, recognizing that that reporter is not there with an agenda. They're not there to hurt you. They're there to do a job. And if we help them and we help them do their job, they're going to help us do our job. You know, a, a well-spoken fire lieutenant at a four alarm fire conveying facts in, in a timely manner to a news reporter is going to help that reporter put together a good story of the professional work you're doing, which will count come budget time. Yep, you do exactly. enough of those, stack those dominoes. Exactly. I agree with you on that. And uh, we do, that's one thing that we do push out a lot on, in our department. We're not always available to be out there at three o'clock in the morning. And mm -hmm. there's no reason for us to go out there unless it's a major, major scene. But all of our, our supervisors, they'll talk. They'll let the media know what's going on. And, and that little, what, 12 seconds, 30 seconds of video that they got that maybe gets condensed down to eight seconds. Exactly. Story. Exactly. Yeah. And also you hit that right in the head too. It's not just the chiefs that, have, that are going on camera. We saw this a decade or so ago where you have to wait for the chief, wait for the chief. Well, I'm putting sergeants on camera. I'm putting lieutenants on camera, fire captains on camera. I'm putting patrol officers on camera for certain stories. And that's important. We want to show a diversity of, of voice and viewpoint. We want to show the humans that work here. You know, I teach my clients. It's a sad lesson, but I teach my clients you work for the government, which means at the beginning, you are nothing more than a salary and a job title. You're not a brother, sister, mom, daughter, uncle, whatever, friend. You are a cost and a rank. And that will stay until you get around it, until you prove to people that you're Joe or Jane or, or Sue or Tom, or you're, you're a person, you're a coach, you're a valuable member of the community. And going on camera is one way we, we put that out to our community when we put put these officers these firefighters who are doing the job out there or if you're running a program 
there's no reason why the chief has to go and co-op that and go on camera. Or maybe they go on camera too, but the officer running the basketball program talks about their own work and it humanizes the police and firefighters that, um, you know, we know that 99.999% of police officers are there for the right reason, doing great heroic work and are not deserving of the broad brush they've been painted with. But you, you, you wear blue and you wear blue and carry a badge and a gun. So you're going to get painted that way. So now you've got to prove it. And it's, it's not fair, but it, 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 it's, it, is, it is what it is. You know, you've got to prove that. You've got to earn that every single day. I agree. John, is there a question I should have asked? And, and if so, how would you have answered it? Well, you know, I, I think looking at the future of media relations is a big topic right now for us. Uh, and, you know, I, we hinted at the newspapers. Uh, there's there's still plenty of great newspaper reporters out there doing amazing work. Um, they're overworked. They're underpaid, certainly. Uh, and they've been given more of a responsibility. Um, you know, reporters are covering multiple towns or multiple regions. You're not sitting in town hall. You're not making the relationships. So for me, the, the challenge I offer my PIOs and my chiefs that I work with is you now have to be the one that goes and build that relationship where a generation ago, a, a reporter would go and try to seek you out, make a source relationship, try to build that up. They don't have time, frankly. Um, the TV ones do. For the most part, but the newspaper reporters are largely are so stretched beyond their their capacity that they don't have the time to spend hours a week um, source building or building those relationships. So we should carry that stick, and we should be going out and building those relationships. Those will pay dividends when you when you treat people like people. Reporters are just human beings doing a difficult job for not enough money. That should sound familiar to everyone that listens to your podcast. Um, they, they, for the most part, want to do good, noble work. And if, if we take the time to get to know them and work with them, it will pay off at the end of the day. There's too many people that are just written off as anti-cop when, when they covered um, the domestic or the drunk driving arrest. Covering bad story does not make you anti-cop. No. It makes you a reporter. Yep. It, and, you know, I have a, a really good reporter here in, in the Chicagoland area when I was stationed there. Um, ben Bradley, I did a interview, I did a walkthrough with him and uh, my daughter, my daughter is a journalist now, and Ben made this comment, he goes, we are supposed to be the mirror of the, of the world. That's our job. We are the mirror. And yeah. we just have to remember that. They're just reflecting the story that is already there and, and sharing it with the community at large. Exactly. And uh, there's a big flux going on in the newspaper newsrooms, especially right now, you know, people like Marty Barron recently retired as the Washington Post executive editor was, uh, you know, my boss's 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 boss of the Boston Globe one time ago. Um, you know, he talks about the need to relook at uh, and refocus on objectivity for a new generation. I worked at the Boston Globe when a, a co-op, an intern was fired for putting on, on Facebook something that was viewed as pro-Palestine. That was taking a side on a controversial issue. Fired. Right. I would argue, uh, and I'm not going to cite sources right now, but I would argue that a journalist is not being dismissed for posting similarly or even more uh, charged political viewpoints on social media today. And that's a reckoning or a conversation that our newsrooms are, are dealing with right now. Yep, I agree with you. All right, John, let's change uh, uh, roles here. Let's go to some rapid fire questions. Texting or Talking. Talking. I'm always in the car, so I prefer to, prefer to be under the law anyway. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Adult drink of choice? Ooh, uh, I'm going to go uh, single malt scotch. Nice. What well, would be a superpower if you could have one? Teleportation. Get me somewhere else oh. and then get me somewhere else. <laughs> uh, what's one thing you regret spending money on? Ooh, oh, uh, I bought a three thousand dollar laptop with a with a loan when I was a sophomore in college. Took Ooh. me till my grad school to pay that thing off. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and it probably didn't even work that great at that point. It worked great, but it stayed at my desk the whole time because it weighed about fourteen pounds back then. Oh so I never God. brought it anywhere. <laughs> uh, what's a movie, book, or TV show that changed your life? Oh. Um, I would say that watching Spotlight, which uh, I have some disagreements with, but you know, I came to the Globe right after that that whole series happened with the Spotlight team. Uh, that was a big eye opener for me. Uh, watching you know story, you know, watching fictionalized accounts of that are that are very realistic 
have always spoken to me uh, about that. But uh, on the more a more entertaining side, the TV show Burn Notice. Uh, somehow I ended up, for those of you that have ever watched the show, I ended up buying a Dodge Charger, living in a loft, and named my first daughter Fiona. I can't guarantee it's not related to that show at the end of the day. So that was my that was my indulgence in the in the late uh, late early aughts. That's awesome. Ask permission or beg for forgiveness. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for permission, Guy. I like to get it right. Okay. What world record do you think you'd have a chance of breaking? Oh, most press releases written in a year. Um, put us up against any corporate firm. We got them, we got them licked. <laughs> what do you think people misunderstand about you? Uh, I, I think people think that I'm a cheerleader and – it's not, you know, it takes five minutes to realize that I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist, but I'm no cheerleader. And and I'm pretty sure I have an idea on this one. Are you a thinker or a doer? I'm actually a thinker, believe it or not. I come to my office. I, they, they, they've made fun of me. They, I have what's called John's idea of the day, sometimes referred to as John's dumb idea of the day, but we've got some winners out of that. Uh, I, I've got ideas for ideas for ideas at the end of the day. I, I feel like I do a lot, but uh, I have an ideas guy. Awesome. John, final thoughts. What key points would you like our listeners to take away from the interview today? One thing, I stop all my my talks at some point, and I, I remind them of a very important fact, PIOs and supervisors and chiefs. The PIO is important. The public information officer is one of the most important managers of your reputation, your legitimacy, your message your perception, and even your budget. They have a huge impact on you. Um, you know, at Twitter, uh, Adam, the PIO, I can't, I have to borrow this from him. I can't take credit for it. Uh, you know, he says, you know, your PIO is often the first person to be asked about things. Don't let them be the last to know. Remember how important your comms person is and don't just act the part, manage it. You know, make sure that your staff knows that the PIO is a member of the command staff and that they're going to be listening. They're going to be in the room when the decisions are getting made. Anything else you'd like to add, John? No, I, I, I believe that that policing, and we talked a lot about policing today. I think policing is a good and noble profession. I, I think that it's had a lot of challenges in the past decade, but I, I, I don't believe, and I've never believed that policing is inherently ignoble or inherently racist or inherently brutal. Uh, and I think that if we get past the us versus them mindset and we accept the, 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 the humility that should come with carrying a badge and a gun that should come with taking that oath, that, that does come with that for almost everyone. If we get back to basics as an industry, I know that we can recover from the, the crises that we're in. And I think that we'll continue to build up support in our communities. And I don't just mean, again, I don't mean just that cheerleading support. I mean, that we'll, we'll build up genuine equity with our constituents if we just get that, you know, get ourselves to be as humble as possible and respond to those questions. That's outstanding, John. And you know what? That makes it makes me think of uh, my next question here. How can people best reach you if they want to connect or follow up? But the reason I say this is I have a lot of chiefs that from smaller agencies that listen to this that are probably looking for somebody like you. So What's the best way they can reach you? Yeah, and we and we'll do a police website for for near on a thousand dollars one time. I mean, we really we we want the volume because we want to show people what we could do. But beyond that, you know, we we do the full suite of corporate style communications and PR for every type of government entity. Um, I'm on Twitter, of course, at John Guilfoyle, uh, Facebook uh, uh, at Guilfoyle PR. Uh, but the two best ways to reach me are email and by phone. Email is John, J-O-H-N, at J-G-P-R. That's a Juliet Golf Papa Romeo dot net. And my phone number is 617-993-0003. You can always reach me there. And if you call that number, what I, what I tell people that I've networked with or I've connected with is, um, you know, we, we are looking for colleagues or we are, we try to be a colleague in the, in the profession. So if somebody calls me uh, and they have a question or are in crisis or have a reporter breathing down their neck or they're worried about their job, um, we do not ask about the bill first. We, we ask how we could help first. And if there is no bill, then that's, that's fine on us. We'd rather be looked at as an ally and an asset to people who want to do the right thing. And we know we'll, we'll make our living in the long run. John, thank you very much for being on this show. And I will add all of that information into the show notes. So they'll be able to click on it when they uh, look at the, uh, the uh, uh, podcast. So John Guilfoyle, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Robert. Be safe.
Hold on, let me hit the off button here.